from Slovenia, Luca Breckel. And uh, Luca is a lawyer and business consultant turned entrepreneur. His company, Quantify, is a rapidly growing startup, which helps management accept better strategic decisions and implement change using organizational diagnostics. Luca was already a workaholic at five years old. So we want to talk about that. And uh, when he was a kid, he wanted to be a firefighter, later a rock star, a lawyer, or a businessman. So welcome to the show, Luca. I mean, you've had amazing plans as a child. You ended up uh, a businessman, a lawyer, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually yeah. did a bit of uh, rocking as well. I actually recorded a CD in 2012 uh, with a rock band, but it was a short-lived career. It was more fun than anything serious. Awesome. Uh, and so you didn't work as a firefighter, no? <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, that's that's the one thing that is still missing on my checklist. Maybe I'll do it at uh, some point and just try to, to uh, explore that bit as well. But uh, yeah, I studied law. Then I worked at CMS Law & Tax where I was mostly focusing on business transactions and M&A and corporate law. I got tired of it quite fast. And so the, my, let's say, businessman type of career took over. I started as a legal and business consultant to many entrepreneurs and to many tech companies. And two years ago, I started my own. So I am a startup founder myself now. You started the journey of being a real entrepreneur and founded a fast-growing uh, company. But let's start right in the beginning. You said you've been a workaholic already at the age of five. Yeah. I mean, I have two kids. They are now a bit older than five. I still can't call them a workaholic. So uh, how does it uh, happen uh, at an age of five that you even understand what workaholic uh, is about? Well, you know, it's it's not that I remember a lot from, from those times, but, uh, but that's still like an ongoing running joke inside my family that one of my most common words to my parents are, leave me alone, I'm working. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I used to play with Legos all the time. I, I used to spend like eight, even 10 hours a day yeah. actively engaged into building stuff, building stuff with Legos. So everybody thought that over time, I'll probably become some sort of an engineer or something like this. Maybe, maybe go into architecture or anything like that. But uh, yeah, my my love for relationships and exploring the people side of things took me into a different direction over time. Okay, well then I can all say that my kids are also workaholic because. Everywhere in our flat, we have Lego, you know, and when you walk around at night, you know, uh, without shoes, then it's hurting sometimes quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. It's a, it's a dangerous, uh, dangerous toy, but I think it's one of the best toys you could uh, like give to your kids because it really builds their imagination. Exactly. And you can also, as a parent, learn a lot about your kids from the way they play with Legos. Because if I compare mm -hmm. how my younger brother played with Legos to, to the way I played, it tells a lot about our uh, way of thinking. You know, I, for example, watched a movie and it inspired me. And so I recreated the set from the movie. I, you know, if I watch something about aliens, there were spaceships. If I watched Top Gun, there were airplanes, right? And I, I yeah. built like a whole, whole new environment of where I explored my imagination. But once I built it, I didn't really play with it much. And this is where my younger brother came in. He was the one who likes to actually play. So instead of building, he was very interested in using the airplanes and doing the firefights. <laughs> okay. Well, you have a lawyer background uh, and now you, you work in organizational psychology. So this is quite a step. Yeah. Um, how, I mean, how did you found out that uh, you're very interested in this topic? I, I would say that I was actually interested in this topic even before I studied law. You know, I was mm -hmm. always like in my class, I always like to organize things. I would uh, also, when I used to train uh, handball, I was uh, oftentimes the, like, you know, the, the lead player organizing the game and so on. And so I, I always felt this drive to understand how people relate to each other, how they organize in order to get things done efficiently and effectively, right? But um, my family background, you know, not, neither of uh, my parents is uh, an entrepreneur or a businessman. So I, I didn't really know much about business. And I thought it's something very abstract, something very hard to get into. So I opted for law because I, I knew that it's very related to business. Mm -hmm. And it's a good way to, you know, it's an entry point, point for me yes. to get into business. 
So this is the reason why I actually opted for law. And the other reason is that I was, I, I do, do have sort of an engineer analytical mindset, but I really prefer people to things. So law is one of these areas where you can kind of uh, combine the two. The other ones is economics and the third one would be organizational psychology. So I think, you know, the, Looking back, all the dots really connect nice, nicely and it's a very obvious path. Whereas at any point in time, I had no idea what the future holds for me. Yes. When we go through life, you know, um, as you said, connecting the dots and, and trusting that things will work out in the end. This is a skill which helped me a lot in the past, you know, to uh, really accept that something happened, you know, and I, I was thinking, yes, I mean, just wait. And see how things connect. And in the end, something will, will happen. Something will create out, out of that, you know, and you end up at a place where we didn't really intended to be, you know, but it just worked out. And obviously uh, this happened for you. I mean, organizational psychology is a very interesting and important topic. You know, I mean, we live in a, in a, in a really fast paced world and um, we have to be able to create high performance teams. And first of all, knowing yourself and knowing individuals really helps a lot to understand how we behave, how we communicate, and how we could basically work together to achieve something great. So, I mean, there are many assessments out there. How do you differentiate from the industry for the big players? And uh, how do you apply your assessment at the clients? Sure. So, Quantify stands for Organizational Diagnostics. And this is the main point of the differentiations with the majority of the surveys you'll find out there. So, you know, most of the surveys, like, let's say, for example, uh, employee satisfaction, it provides you with a certain result, like your employee satisfaction is at 72%. And maybe they add in a benchmark saying that this is, let's say, 5% above the industry average. But where, where do you go beyond this? If you're an HR, uh, VP of HR or a CEO, what do you do with this information? Yeah. It's, well, just a random piece of, yeah, it's just a random piece of information. It doesn't really help you in terms of how do we get from 72 to 85. And mm -hmm. this is what I found lacking. In fact, you know, when I was studying and reading about management, I sort of found that it's not really at the point of science yet. I would say that it started becoming a science with, with Peter Drucker, but even to today, it's still a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of an art, a lot of fat that feeling, and, yeah. exactly, and not, not really all that mm. much science in terms of what actually works. And so mm. with Quantify, we really try to see it, if it were a science, how would it look like? So we would measure things, then we would predict certain results, certain outcomes, and We would follow up over time to see whether this prediction, whether this, uh, let's say, uh, active measures actually achieved the desired results, because that's, you know, the essence of scientific method. And so this is what makes, uh, this is why I call it organizational diagnostics, whereas mm -hmm. most of these surveys out there are more uh, organizational analytics. You know, then yes. they don't really help you develop a specific action plan and track you over time to, to help you adjust it. So this is what differentiates Quantify from anything I've really seen out there. So you basically go to an organization, you uh, do an assessment, but you work with company in the long run and see mm -hmm. how they uh, develop over time. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that the long-term vision for Quantify is to really bring science into management. Ideally, you know, we'd be following thousands of companies across the globe or hundreds of thousands. The, the more data, the better. And mm -hmm. over time, build a very accurate system or matrix of what different pathologies exist out there and how they mm -hmm. can be addressed. And we could do this in a very predictable manner. Much like if you imagine in, I don't know, 15th century, when you went to a doctor, it was a matter of whether this doctor is any good or not. And there was not much science behind it yet. Well, sometimes when you go to a doctor today, you still have the same um, really? thought, you know, that, uh, hey, I, mean, I hope he knows. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, there are so many, when you go to five doctors, you get 10, 10 opinions. Yeah? I mean, uh, I would argue mm -hmm. there's also still a lot of improvement uh, in this in this field. Of course, the, the truth is that also for, for Quantify, you know, the vision, this, this yeah. ideal of being able to understand exactly, 
you know, the organizational structure, culture, and dynamics, and being able to identify the pathologies and predict what kind of measures should be implemented in order to break these negative patterns and make this organization work uh, more efficiently. This is, of course, an ideal that will be, you know, over time, we'll get closer and closer to it, but I don't think we will ever really achieve it. However, you know, the closer you get to, the better the exactly. outcomes and the progress is what matters. This is quite a fast-growing startup. I mean, you started two years ago. Yeah, huh? even less, actually. March less. Even less? It's, uh, oh. it's 19th month now. 19th month. And uh, you have 18 employees or team members in the company. So this is rapid growth. Uh, so uh, you not only have to develop the product, uh, uh, you also have to develop an organization and you have to ensure funding Yeah, that uh, you can pay your employees. I mean, I, I know that you went through a funding round, mm -hmm. which was quite challenging for you. Yeah, And let's talk a little about that because I know that uh, many listeners, they are in the process of looking for funds, especially at This time, many companies are um, focusing on uh, where do they get the next investment. I'm also a business angel and investor and I see what's happening on the market. There are many startups looking for cash. And how did it work for you? Yeah, well, being a startup adds a whole new layer of complexity to the game of business, I would say. Yeah. Because, you know, if you run a, like a common, common business that already has an established business model and everything is... There's still a lot of risk, but there's a lot of known unknowns and there's a lot of knowns already. Whereas startup mm -hmm. is unknown, unknown territory all around. And the other thing is that if you bootstrap your business, if you know your basic business intelligence, you know, how much does it cost me how to, to, let's say, produce a product, how much I can sell it for, what's the margin. If you have these basics and fundamentals well set out, you know where you're going and you know how you'll be growing over time. Whereas with the startup, It's a lot harder. It's a completely different ballgame. It adds this complexity of having to sell not only to your customers, but even more so to investors. And if yeah. you'd like, I can tell you a bit about how it went the last time. Uh, you know, Please. It's complicated yeah. in my best day of my life and the worst day of my life being on the exact same day. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. So, you know, the, the first funding we got was from a couple of local business angels. And that was enough for, for me to scale a team to, let's say, about 10, 12 employees full time. Then we were able to develop, uh, uh, let's say, the first versions of, of our product, get our first clients on board, even get a little bit of revenue, but not nearly enough to sustain you know, the, the team and the uh, product development that we had. So mm -hmm. over time, uh, I made a strategic decision, even though it was a, a tough, tough call. Even though we only had like four months of runway left, I opted to go uh, to an accelerator in Israel. The reason being that Slovenian startup ecosystem is not very strong yet. It's hard mm -hmm. to get uh, any kind of decent money. And also, you know, I'd say like the gener generally people here don't dare to risk quite as much. Even when I used to pitch uh, and, and said, you know, we are building this business to go to the Uh, United States, everybody was like, yeah, but why not Austria or Germany? You know, it's it's a more common thing for Slovenians to think regionally rather, mm. rather than globally, right? And so I, I decided to go to Israel to be exposed to this global, mind, uh, you know, global mindset. Um, and I spent three months there. It was a great experience, but, you know, it depleted our runway completely. And by the end, even though the, the program was set to essentially end up in an investment. Sadly, it, it was not quite as you know we expected. So I didn't get the investment, even though we were considered by far the, the best startup of this program. And you can ask them if you don't believe me. Anyways, I came home with no money. So I, I had to rush it and find somebody to invest in our company within a month. Of course, I couldn't find anybody to to go on sh such short short notice yeah. i opened a few conversations but by the time i had to you know pay the wages there was already 15 full-time employees plus, plus myself and i couldn't pay to anybody so two days three days before that i had a, a meeting with our existing boards of in, board of investors 
all of them suggested that I do, you know, the classical crisis management and just let all the people go and convert it into bootstrapped model. But mm. in a business mm. like ours, I just invested like half a year, almost one year into yes. building yes. these people. They are just starting to generate some value for us. This exactly. would be the exactly. most stupid possible decision to make. In such business would be gone. Yeah. For you. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. And so instead, you know, I went to, to my people. I always wanted to be as transparent as possible. So it was not like something they didn't know. They were aware that we are running out of funding. But I told them, look, mm-hmm. the shit has hit the fan. We are, we are here. And for next month or, you know, foreseeable future, I, I'll probably need at least two, three months in order to get this new funding. So anybody who wants to leave, this is, you know, a good time to leave. I still mm-hmm. have some funding left so my the door to my office will be open i cleared all my meetings so please come one by one and i will talk to you and see how much money you need and i'll make sure that nobody's thrown out of the flat because they didn't pay their rent or something like this yeah. and as you can imagine you know i didn't sleep the night before this talk and uh, i i felt even today when i talk about it it's still difficult for me and so the first person, uh, I think Nates was the first to come in. He comes in and gives me 250 euros and says, I know, Luca, it's not much, but I ran to, to, to the ATM and I got some money and I want to support this business. I think probably Amazing. somebody more than I do. Then the next oh. girl comes in and she's like, hey, um, actually my parents list on doctor because we have you know work from home policy as well so she, so mm. she said that uh, oftentimes when he had our uh, weekly meetings the parents were you know in the background and that they support us a lot and that uh, they already told her that they would be willing to pay her wage just for her to be in this company so she said that as far as i'm concerned for the next three six, three to six months my parents will not be angry if you just don't pay me then the next oh. one came in they you know just <laughs> Almost everybody, I think two out of two out of 15 asked for money. The rest, all of them was like, you know, keep going. What matters is that we survive this. I know, we know you will get money. You are always transparent with us. We trust you. We trust the business. Let's keep going. So, you know, in the morning by 10 o'clock when we finished the meeting, this was the worst day of my life. And... By the time I spoke to everybody, it was yeah. like, I don't know, 3, 3 p.m., something like this. This was the best day of my life. <laughs> it amazing. was amazing. I mean, yeah. And by the way, you... the, the, the story doesn't end there. It, it got even crazier, you know. I spoke to a lot of my, my friends. I've built a strong, uh, strong ne- network here. And a couple of mm-hmm. my more business-oriented friends told me, look, at the only way to solve this problem is to come with us on a boat for two days and not think about it, and we will you know, <laughs> we'll find something. <laughs> and I did. And the craziest yeah. thing happened. We went with the boat, and we stopped at like small Croatian island and landed mm-hmm. right next to one of the most prominent businessmen in Slovenia, Jos Pececnik. And so we called up to the guy, and we were like, hey, would you mind, you know, sitting down with, with, with us and, you know, maybe talk. And after the second day that we spent there, went to lunch together and so on, he asked me, hey, how much money do you actually need? I was like, for now, I need at least half a million. He was like, you got it. So <laughs> it was as crazy as that. I, I'm not even joking. Like, I am a big analytical guy, very into science. Yes. But man, this yeah. was divine providence or something like this. I cannot... I cannot even begin to explain. You know, I mean, first of all, I mean, you have an amazing team. This really shows that you're an amazing leader. Yeah? You have a vision, you trust your people, they trust you. Yeah? Otherwise, they wouldn't have acted like this. I mean, you must have done really an amazing job uh, with them. Yeah, really. Uh, to be honest, I com- wish to take the credit, you know, but it's, it's yeah. really not like this. I, I would say it's not just, uh, let's say, the founder or the CEO, mm-hmm. but especially the first five people who joined the company. They really helped yeah. build this uh, culture. And I was mm. very, you know, on one hand lucky. And on the other hand, I did have, have sort of a system to achieve that. Yeah. Where, where the first five people are really, you know, all in. They, they are almost at the founder level of dedication. Uh, and also mm. the other thing is that the team is very young. So they are a lot more risk prone. 
I would say the average age is about 26 in the company. And, and this really helps because people at this yeah. stage are still willing to take risks. Most of them don't have families and Big obligations. Yeah. innovation because they don't yet have the box. You know, there is no yeah, such exactly. <laughs> free time, you know? So that, that really helps. However, it, of course, uh, you know, nothing is just positive and having a very young team like this requires me to get a lot of outside mentorship of people who have a lot more experience. And yes. also it requires me to be a lot more hands-on and help them build the processes and uh, structure things because mm -hmm. otherwise it would be a total chaos very fast. So I would say partly I am to blame for the situation, but uh, it's a team effort for sure. And oftentimes I, I have my own you know, failures, the team helps me, uh, helps me correct. And I, I cannot carry all the burden by myself. And oftentimes I've seen other people help me pick it up and just, you know, do the management part. Yeah. When I don't have time or do, um, you know, do client processing when I can't help them or so on. But also, I mean, I have a theory, you know, one of my mentors uh, always says, life is happening for you, not to you. Uh, and Those things like you, you go on a boat cruise, yeah, and then you just meet and someone who gives you half a million uh, euros. I mean, this is an amazing story, but this really proves this statement, yeah? So maybe you should, you, you really needed to come to this point where you had these tough discussions with your team. And then uh, you, your, your friends took you out. I mean, if they wouldn't have taken you out on this boat ride, then you would probably never met this entrepreneur. You know, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. so everything happens. I mean, my theory, everything happens for a reason. I mean, for you, it, it worked out fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And always worth reflecting. And whenever we have a challenge in life, just wait, you know, often this challenge turns out into something beautiful. Uh, mm -hmm. So we all have to never lose trust. I mean, this is one of the important things, especially for, for startup uh, founders, I mean, this is a rough time, you know, it's lots of ups and downs, but uh, as long as we, we, we keep our faith and uh, we trust the process, then things often work out. Yeah, true. You know, I'd be a little bit reserved to, to say anybody that what I did was good. It was strategically speaking, I did a couple of, you know, wrong moves. I probably shouldn't have gone to Israel and go, you know, to fundraising immediately. It would be the more prudent thing. You never know. <laughs> yeah, true. true. But... Um, On, on the point where you said life is happening to you, I have a little bit different idea about this and maybe it's worth mm -hmm. exploring. So I would say that life is happening through you. You know, because when, when, if you say that life is happening for you, oftentimes mm -hmm. it will lead people into thinking, oh, it's about hedonism. It's a matter of, you know, enjoying myself and so on. But I, I feel that there's a lot more mm -hmm. responsibility at play. For mm -hmm. example, When I used to do, you know, my own business and legal consulting practice, I earned more than I earned in Quantify, you know, like about sure. five times much for sure. Yeah. And the, the other thing is I, I was my own boss. I had my own schedule out under control. I could work from any, anywhere in the world. It was great lifestyle, but I mm -hmm. felt incomplete. I felt yeah. like I'm not doing my best. I felt like, you know, I, and I started resenting some of my clients. Because I felt like they are doing something more valuable. They are creating mm. businesses, building teams and all of the things that I felt like I should be doing. And so in mm. that sense, when this idea of this organizational diagnostics and representing a company as a social or communication network and so on hit me, struck me, it stuck yeah. with me for months. And I felt like, you know, there is something here to explore. And in that sense, I would say this idea did not really come from me, but it came through me and it's mm -hmm. up to me. I'm responsible to the idea. And that's why also yeah. when I was thinking whether to look for funding and try to really make it happen fast and on a global level versus bootstrapping, like mm -hmm. usually if, if I was consulting to somebody, I would say bootstrap first, start building Make sure yeah. that your assumptions are correct. Don't go raise funding until you can prove your business model. All of that stuff, because it's, mm -hmm. it's, prudent. it's theoretically right. Yeah. Whereas I felt that if this idea is to achieve its full greatness, I have to go out of my comfort zone, even though yeah. 
my life will be worse for it, so to speak, at least in the, the short and midterm. But that is a risk. I, I mean, exactly. But I am responsible oh. to this idea. And in that sense, I think saying that life sort of goes through you, you should try to find what kind of like vehicle are you? What, yes. what is it that you are supposed to bring to this world? And I'm not saying this in any religious sense per se, but mm. just in terms of uh, achieving your highest uh, given potential and making sure that it really comes out of you. I completely agree. I mean, if life is happening for you, not to you, I mean that all these challenges we face in life, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. often they have, a, they have a, a meaning in the end. You know, I mean, they, they lead to something greater. You develop more skills, you develop more, more capabilities. Yeah? Uh, you, you take risks. And then looking back now uh, in your journey, and I, I mean, I still would say going to Israel uh, would, was probably an, a wise decision. Maybe you develop skills there you need in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you met someone there which knocks on your door in a, in a year's time and then something else is created out of that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, there are always uh, these opportunities. Uh, what I just wanted to say is that, you know, even a layer. So if you're a reactive person, then life is happening to you. If yes, you're more exactly. proactive, then life is happening for you. But what yeah. I'm trying to say is that I feel like there's a layer even beyond that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where you see yourself as being the vehicle to manifest something good that is beyond exactly. you. And in that sense, yeah. you are sort of sacrificed for the better better future of mankind. And I think it's the only fair way to look at life because in order for us to, to be here and uh, be able to, to speak on this podcast, you know, there, there must have been thousands and thousands of people who worked really hard. Some even died in wars and so on for us to bring us to that level of technological advancement where we have the, you know, the time and space and technology to be able to afford a nice conversation like this. Yeah. Yeah. I completely, completely agree. And, uh, I like your attitude. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I always say, Hey, I mean, we only have one life, you know, we need to create something out of it. We should plan our life. You know, I mean, most people, they spend more time planning their holiday and planning their life, you know, they are always in this reactive mode, you know, where, oh yeah, this is happening and then I have to do that. And then they're not really, they're not really becoming the creators of their own destiny. And uh, I mean, this is my way of managing and creating my life. And then we have uh, very similar uh, views on that. I think it's the same also, even like on the level of, of companies, oftentimes, mm -hmm. So you have as a CEO uh, and even as VP of HR, you think more about these uh, outputs and measuring, you know, the financial side of things and so on, as if it was a basic uh, production or manufacturing business, mm. you know, as if the people were just basic machines there and it's obvious that they will, you know, do their work in the right way and so on. Strategic planning, the, the way I see it, even in communication with some of like really big corporations It seems that it's almost a bit of an afterthought or a nice to have rather than, mm -hmm. than a must have. And I would yeah. really like to see also with help of Quantify to, to start changing that, to, to put people first, but in the right way, not just, oh, let's, you know, the financials are bad. People are hate each other. Just slap one team building over that and everything will be fine. <laughs> it's not going to be fine. Team building is not going to resolve it at all. No. You, have to, you have to start from scratch and understand what's going on. Why are they unhappy? Uh, exactly. are, are we even investing in the right things? Like one of the things we measure is what motivates the employees. They rank different mm -hmm. motivational factors, right? Yes. And they also rank the company on satisfaction. And oftentimes mm -hmm. we see that uh, they rank, for example, the, uh, the work environment is not really all that important to them. It's like number 14 on their list. Whereas mm -hmm. the management is saying, oh, next year we are renovating the building. No, don't renovate the building. They don't care about that. They don't care about that. How about you go for one, one to five and one of them being, for example, uh, more free time to, to, you know, spend with kids and family, maybe employ two mm -hmm. more people. So people will have a little bit more free time and they will appreciate that much more, especially if they know that you measure that and then you mm -hmm. acted upon it because then they know that you really care and want to do something about it. So that's, that's really the idea behind. 
But that's the important point, you know, acting on it. Because I've seen so many times that companies, they measure certain activities, certain points in the, in the organization, but then they don't take action. You know, they don't take action. And then really employees ask themselves, hey, you know, why did I spend time in, in giving you my opinion if you obviously don't uh, care about what, what I think? Yeah, And uh, so this is a very important uh, topic. And, and this is why I think it's important to to stay with an organization for a longer period of time to really make sure that they implement, that they act on your results. Uh, otherwise, yes. it's like a short otherwise, fire. and then Yeah, if you just have a mere measurement, you, you're just aware of the situation. But it's it's like saying, oh, the house is on fire and just waiting there. No, you know, you, you have to call, you have to call the rescue service, you have to call the firefighters to, to do something about it. Otherwise, it will just be on fire until it collapses. Um, Oh. And way too often times we see this and like in the last six months or so, we even implemented sort of a countermeasure where we mm-hmm. request commitment of the management that goes and starts working with us to actually act on these results. Because the whole mm-hmm. point of the analysis is not the analysis itself, but preparation of a specific action plan on the level of a department, which is you know yes. more specific and on the level of the company which is more of a yeah. company policy and when you when you act, act on those two and start implementing uh, and people start seeing results they don't have a problem being with the commitment of filling out the surveys and so on that's that's another like huge point because we get our mm-hmm. data with surveys and everybody's like yeah but don't they don't already have enough of the surveys look if like we said, you know, people spend a lot of time at work. Every day they go there. And if if you have a shitty boss and shitty colleagues and shitty work, then most of your life is probably shitty. And uh, at least one third of it, however you want to spin it, right? Mm. So definitely people do care about all of these things. But in order for them to dedicate some time to filling out surveys and uh, answering uh, truthfully and being active in trying to do something about it, they need to know that management actually cares. And the only way yeah. for management to show that they care is exactly what you said. They have to act upon this information. Exactly. What is on the uh, horizon for Quantify? How do you see the next two years evolving? Yeah, any, what are your big plans? Well, the, the big uh, change that's going to happen soon is that we're going to establish presence on the US market. And this mm-hmm. is going to be a big endeavor. It changes a lot of things also for, for us. Uh, and I'd say it requires the, the company to get on the next level of, of everything, yeah. of, of product, mm-hmm. of marketing, of uh, internal organization, of uh, business partnerships, everything we, has to be scaled up for another level. So this is planned for next year. I expect it to happen within the third quarter of next year to establish a company in the US. And Mm -hmm. by then, I also already want to have at least 10% of uh, our revenue coming in from US companies. That's also Mm -hmm. important for us because of, you know, all the uh, market insecurities and what's going on on just speaking global markets and especially European Union that this, I don't think is on the best trajectory. So from from the point of currency and all of that, it's a good idea to maybe hedge your bets a little bit. But Unfortunately, I think you are right. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's a very important uh, step. And if mm-hmm. we if we can prove that we are successful on on US market and our differentiation from uh, giants like uh, Culture Amp is uh, big enough, uh, which yeah. I, I'm very confident that we will, then we would like to raise another our A round to. Mm-hmm and scale up so this would be yeah. let's say, the main things in terms of the overall business development whereas on the background of course there's a lot of product development going on we recently launched a, uh, a set of what we call pulse surveys so you know the actual analytical tool of quantify requires quite a bit of engagement from employees it takes about half mm-hmm. an hour to 45 uh, 45 minutes to complete per person so that's a significant investment of time, but it's required to really be able to exactly pinpoint what's going on. 
in terms of, yeah. uh, you know, is it a matter of poor communication? Are there some glitches in the communication of networks? Is there some, let's say, group that is closed or maybe a specific person in, is not in the right position based on the role they tend to play and so on? So we can be very specific with that. Once we know that and build an action plan, we have a set of past surveys, like for, you know, if, if you find that they should work on leadership development, we have a five-minute survey that mostly checks these parameters. If mm -hmm. we see that communication is poor, then we'll work probably on psychological safety, on communication networks, and so on. So it's a different survey that aims for that type of parameters. And so when the action plan is being implemented, we can really see whether it has desired effects on the metrics that we'll expect to be changed by it, right? So uh, that's an important improvement. And the next one that we expect to be launching in, in the next two years, or probably already by the end of next year, we already have a Quantify 360, which mm -hmm. allows to understand uh, how each person sees themselves sure. and compare yeah. this to how other people it's see them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's a really important, uh, really important point in your personal growth and development, because we don't want to just... You know, in order to improve an organization, you also have to improve its inter integral parts. And the best way to, to have a person change is to have them see and compare this self-image, you know, auto-portrait with, with how other exactly. people do, right? And this, this is usually a strong driver for change because they see exactly what are the points they are missing, where are the, the blind spots that they might have, and it usually pushes them to action. And the, the next step of our development is to, we already have like about 20 different uh, partners that do uh, different coaching. And we'd like to add to Quantify a platform for this type of coaching. So that once you've seen these blind spots, let's say mm -hmm. communication, you think that you communicate well, whereas other people say that you communicate poorly, this is something that you should explore. And you probably need somebody to guide you through this. Okay, here's a platform. You can uh, connect to one of our coaches that works specifically on communication, and you start making yourself a better coworker. So that's that's a major development. But in order to get to that, we first had to have enough clients to have enough of employees to offer this type of tools or services to. So, I mean, those are amazing uh, growth plans. What do you see the biggest challenge you have to focus on right now? Yeah, so one is definitely uh, funding. In order to achieve these lofty goals, we have to raise some more additional funding, which means that a, a lot of my focus is spent there. Mm -hmm. And in terms of product development, there are, you know, this, we will have to build a little bit bigger team in order to, mm -hmm. to work there. And with this comes additional, let's say, challenge of scaling our team. We've yes. grown very fast from zero to 20 employees in one year and a half. And most of this team, as I said, is quite young and inexperienced. So in order to get to the next level, we'll probably have to hire a few more experienced employees to, to join our team. So this will uh, for sure shift the balances a little bit. We'll have to work on, on our culture to make sure that uh, these people are well integrated and that we continue yeah. to have this spirit of innovation and mutual trust. So that's going to be very important for us. Lots to do. M amazing story. Great company. Thank you so much, Luca, for your time, for this interesting conversation. I really enjoyed it. And I wish you best of luck for your future plans in making uh, the workplace a better place to work. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sebastian, for, for providing me with this opportunity. I really appreciate it and I enjoyed the conversation a lot. I'll be happy to speak to you again anytime.